Well, Buddha, well, good morning, everybody, and thanks for inviting me to speak uh, to you this, this morning. Uh, I've been asked uh, a few times about uh, my memories of the results night back in 1997. It's hard to believe it's 20 years ago uh, now. Uh, I was asked a question earlier on this morning. Did I think when Wales voted yes that I would be First Minister for nearly eight years at the time? And I said, well, uh, Ladbrokes would have paid me a lot of money over the years if I'd had that kind of power and crystal ball. The answer was quite simply no. But I think it's fair to say it did play a defining role in my career subsequently. At that time, I was a councillor in Bridgend. I'd been elected in 1995. I'd just turned 30 in 1997. I was the secretary of Bridgend and Ogmore Say Yes. Wynne Griffiths, the local MP in Bridgend, of course, was very, very uh, supportive of devolution. Ray Powell, who was uh, then the Labour MP in Ogmore, less so. So we had a, a, a split there, I suppose, in terms of, uh, of the way devolution was perceived in two different uh, constituencies within the Labour Party itself. But it was during that period that I met many of the people who would go on to play a defining role, of course, in years subsequent, Leighton, of course, being, uh, being one of them. And Bridgend did say yes, 54% to 46% on a turnout of 51%, if I uh, remember, by the narrowest of margins. But it was noticeable that night that the yes vote increased the further north you went in the county. And so Pathcall voted no in the main. And then as you went further up towards the valley areas, it gradually crept up to 80, 90%. And uh, that was a trend that we saw uh, across Wales and a trend that I bore in mind during the course of the evening. And what a roller coaster that was. I have to confess to you that after I left the county in Bridgend, I went home. I was working the following day at nine, so I couldn't get to the park hotels. So those of you that were there, uh, you enjoyed it on my behalf. And I have to say, when the result came through from Cardiff, I thought, that's it. We're not going to win this now. It's impossible. The ground can't be made up. We knew that Carmarthen should have voted yes. We knew that. But we didn't know the extent of the yes majority there. I thought, I'll watch it till the end. I was actually in bed when I heard, and we checked, today, we checked this this morning, John Piena saying, we hear that Carmarthen has voted yes. Not only has it voted yes, but it's voted yes by a large margin. And that margin is enough to tip Wales over into the yes camp at the end of the night. And that's when we first had the indication that actually what was turning into a slow despair in many, many ways uh, became so positive. It had been a difficult campaign, no question about that. The closeness of the result wasn't a surprise to, to many of us. It's difficult to overturn the status quo. We know that. There were huge challenges in explaining to people what an assembly actually was. I distinctly remember one conversation on the doorstep when someone said to me, this assembly, is it like a school assembly except in Welsh? <laughs> Seriously, uh, the people, they didn't understand. They knew what a parliament was. And at last, we're going to change the name uh, pretty soon in the future. But they didn't understand what an assembly actually did or how it functioned. And it wasn't just a challenge explaining to people on the doors that we knocked there were some, of course, in my own party who were deeply sceptical. I remember we picked up the paper and Slough Smith, particularly, would be there. And Slough, of course, was very strong, strongly against uh, devolution. Now, Tony Blair said last week that he had steamrolled the Labour Party and Wales into devolution. It's undoubtedly true that the Blair bounce and the political confidence of that time helped. But the scale of the Labour win a few months earlier hadn't helped us because people were saying to us on the doorstep, we have a Labour government now, why do we need an assembly as well? That was really an issue on the doorstep. People thought that the battles that they felt had to be fought had been won as a result of the result, as a result of the result in the general election. Many in my own party had come around to the idea of devolution since the no vote in 1979 because of what had happened in the 80s, because of the devastation, inflicted upon Welsh communities in the 1980s. The John Redwood factor played an enormous part because if I had somebody sceptical on the doorstep, I'd say John Redwood. And then people would say, oh yes, we're gonna vote yes now. Um, I sometimes wonder whether at some point in time a statue of John Redwood would be placed in the, in the assembly because it, in some ways, this is not an exaggeration, in some ways, what had happened with his appointment and what he'd done tipped the balance of the referendum because people felt aggrieved that for the third time we had a Secretary of State that not only wasn't representative of people in Wales, but didn't seem to care. The other two, you could argue, took an interest. John Redwood, I would argue, less so. Now, much has been said about the fact that what was on offer in 1997 
uh, was all that Wales and the Welsh Labour Party, it wasn't even called that then, Labour Party Wales, what, those, what Wales and the party were ready for. Now, as someone who always had confidence in the idea of devolution, I had no problem with seeing devolution as being utterly consistent with the Labour values and tradition. I didn't share the feeling that we had to have less than Scotland. Never have, never will. And so for me, the settlement in 1999 was only ever going to be something that was a step in a particular direction. I was impatient for change and frustrated at the limited deal we were being offered. But there was one person whose quiet determination and belief pervaded all this discussion around devolution throughout the first decade of devolution itself, and that was Rodri. Now, my predecessor's sudden and untimely death in May of this year has given rise to a lot of reflection, and it would be remiss of me not to touch upon the impact that his time as First Minister had on the 20 years since the referendum in 97, because Rodri found a voice for our fledgling democracy. His positive brand of Welshness, a rejection of the hard edge of patriotism, an all-encompassing, inclusive patriotism, helped to solidify Labour as the party of devolution and allowed Welsh Labour, and we're called that now, Welsh Labour to develop and mature. He took us on the journey from the tiny majority in 1997 to what was a resounding affirmation of devolution in 2011. I know it was about the question of primary powers, well, three paragraphs long on the, on, the, on the ballot paper itself. But actually, 2011 was, to me, a strong affirmation of devolution itself. If the vote had gone the other way in 2011, there is no doubt that people would have called into question the very existence of devolution itself. But the people of Wales resoundingly voted for further powers for an institution that only 14 years previously they had been sceptical about in large numbers. Any analysis of what would have happened if that majority of 6,721 uh, hadn't been secured is no longer part of public discussion now. People don't talk about whether there should be devolution. People talk about what devolution should deliver. There are different views on that in different parties, but nobody really has a, a discussion now about whether or not we should have devolution. That is past. That's not to say that there aren't some people, even some in the UK government, who still don't dream of a day when there's no longer a solid pro-devolution majority in Wales. But we know that regular polling now shows a consistent level of support, recognition and trust for the Assembly. Where would we be now if the vote had gone the other day. It's easy to forget the days of one Secretary of State and two junior ministers sitting in the Welsh office, usually in London and not in Cardiff. They were not answerable to the people of Wales, but instead were bit players in the inevitable games played around the UK cabinet table, at least until 97. There's such a contrast to today where we have a flourishing young democracy with all the lobbying and scrutiny that that entails. It means that people in Wales have much more of a say in the services they receive, and Wales is richer for that. In 1997, very many ways, the old adage for Wales see England was still a reality. And that attitude would have taken deep root in the event of a no vote. With Scotland and Northern Ireland, and even the English regions, deciding their own futures, but Wales not. We could not possibly pretend to have called ourselves a nation, bluntly, if we hadn't taken the step to have a democratically elected parliament and a government of our own. I'd like to have made a presentation to FIFA to argue we should have our own football team. No, we didn't have our own democratic institutions. It literally goes as far uh, down as that. We could not pretend to be a nation if we had on two occasions failed to take responsibility for some of our own affairs. That would not have been seen to be credible in the eyes of the world. Now our profile has gone from strength to strength and we can reflect on shared successes. The first country in the UK to introduce deemed consent for organ donation. Free prescriptions, free breakfast for primary school children, unemployment half of what it was 20 years ago. If I'd stood here before you in the 90s and said it would be a regular occurrence for unemployment to be lower than the UK average in Wales, you'd have laughed. 
But that's where we are now. Our unemployment rate is either below the UK average or at the UK average. 20 years ago, it was consistently twice the UK average. We've attracted record levels of foreign direct investment. Why? Because we've got a team of people going out and selling wheels in a way that didn't really happen before in the same way. We wouldn't have Cardiff Airport. It would have shut by now if we hadn't bought it. Now it's the fastest growing airport in Britain, the second fastest growing airport in Europe. That's the difference that, that, that can be made. We supported Wales through a global recession through actions such as PROACT, REACT and Jobs Growth. Wales that helped to create 17,000 jobs for young people. We've embarked on the biggest school and college building programme since the 1960s, 1.4 billion since 2014 alone. We introduced the foundation phase. We know that spending on health and social care in Wales is higher than in England. We've introduced over 50 pieces of primary legislation and 32 acts. And let's just think of some of them. The groundbreaking 2014 Housing Act to help the homeless or those at risk of becoming homeless, which has already helped 8,000 households in Wales. Next year, we'll see the introduction of the first Welsh taxes in almost 800 years. We've made Welsh an official language and strengthened the rights of speakers across the country. We now recycle 64% of our waste compared to 4% in 1997. We have a maximum weekly charge for social care. First country in the world to have a dedicated footpath along our entire coastline, 870 miles. And that's generated 85 million pounds for the Welsh economy and supported over 1,000 jobs. None of that would have happened. None of that would have happened if the vote had gone the other way in 1997. And I would argue that those successes show that devolution has worked on behalf of and delivered for everyone in all parts of Wales. And as our presence on the global stage grows and grows, the eyes of the world are on Wales again and again. And we show that we can deliver again and again. Major sporting events, such as the Ryder Cup and the Champions League final are now possible. If it stood here, again, 20 years ago, and said to you that we'd have the Champions League final in Cardiff, it would have been ridiculous that a country of our size could host such a large event, and we did. And that puts money in people's pockets, because that brings visitors into Wales who spend money in Wales. They have a positive view of Wales, and they want to come back in the future. They spread the message, act as unpaid ambassadors for us. The only thing that's done more for Wales's international profile in the past 20 years is Gareth Bale, quite frankly. <laughs> and the strong and confident country we've become is because of devolution. It's the reality of a devolved Wales, and this success has shown that it was never about being independent. We've all witnessed and play our part in the latest chapter of Wales' history of democracy and internationalism, but the next chapter still unwritten is undoubtedly Brexit. Now, there's no doubt that the withdrawal bill currently going through Parliament is the biggest threat to devolution since its inception. Why do I say that? Well, there are even some lawyers and academics arguing that it's the biggest threat to the Constitution for many hundreds of years. Not me saying that, they say that. The referendum in 1997 may not have been the unequivocal endorsement of devolution that we wanted to in the Yes campaign, wanted to see, but the referendum in 2011, as I said, certainly was. It's nonsense to say that devolution should be undone because of Brexit, but that is the threat that we face. One outcome of the withdrawal bill is that the UK government proposes to take powers for and to itself in relation to devolved policy areas in Wales, and for that matter, in Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. It proposes to alter permanently the fundamental principle that's existed in the Scottish and Northern Irish context for nearly 20 years and has only just been conceded to Wales, namely the principle that says that what is not reserved is devolved. That's just not acceptable. I met Nicola Sturgeon over the summer recess in Edinburgh, and we agreed to work together to oppose the pernicious effects of that bill. And we've reached agreement on some proposed joint amendments, which will be, will be published uh, tomorrow. Now, our politics may be very different, but we're committed to partnership with the Scottish Government to defend not only the institutions in which we respectively operate, but also the democratic principles that the people of Wales and Scotland have resoundingly supported. I have to say the UK government has not yet shown the willingness to engage, and there is still a fundamental lack of trust which must be built. Got to change. We must together, for the sake of the whole UK, make intergovernmental arrangements better. People expect that. And perhaps at this point I should use the F word. That may be all set up. Federalism. 
The UK government, faced with the challenges that Brexit has drawn to the fore, has to engage with us to find a solution fit for the 21st century, because the, the pre-1972 solution will not work. In a paper we published earlier this summer, Brexit and Devolution, it's called, we set out some proposals for what such a solution might look like, centred on a UK Council of Ministers based on parity of esteem between the UK government and the devolved administrations. Now, that was an attempt to start a debate, not to conclude it, and we accept that change is likely to be incremental. In the shorter term, we've made clear that we're prepared to put in place common frameworks where necessary to ensure that, freed from the constraints of EU law, the devolution settlements don't allow individual administrations to undermine the integrity of the single UK market, for example, by competitive deregulation of environmental standards or free-for-all in terms of tax breaks or subsidies to inward investors. We can't win that battle. But such frameworks should be agreed, not imposed. And that's what the UK government seems to find so difficult to accept. Interpreting the mantra of taking back control as meaning an unparalleled concentration of power in the hands of UK ministers. Now, the Brexit vote was about a lot of things for a lot of people, but I don't think anyone was voting for the outcome the UK government now have in mind in terms of devolution. And for Wales to continue to play its part in a conversation about the constitution, we have to turn back to the internal conversations about how devolution works in a Welsh context. Brexit was one of the articulated reasons that we reluctantly voted to give consent to the Wales Act 2017 at the beginning of the year. It was difficult, and it was a finely balanced decision because it wasn't putting Wales on a par with Scotland. But I won't concede that the 2017 Act has somehow provided the long-term sustainable devolution settlement that Wales has been ready for since the 2011 referendum, because the Silk Commission made it decent stab at drawing cross-party consensus on a long-term solution. And for some reason, the UK government failed to put Wales on a par with Scotland when the draft Wales Bill was published in 2015. Listening to the, the, the question that was asked earlier on about the difference between Wales and Scotland in terms of Scotland's previous statehood and Wales lacking its state more or less throughout, throughout its history, that does form part of thinking. It formed part of the people of Wales' thinking at one time. Not now, but it still forms part of the UK government's thinking. Scotland was a state, Wales wasn't, Scotland should have more powers than Wales. We don't accept that. Parity of treatment is essential for the UK in the future and for the UK constitution's stability in the future. Now, in a move of unwitting genius, that draft bill did do two positive things. It articulated the argument better than anything or anyone had previously been able to do, but why we need to grapple with the issues around a Welsh jurisdiction. And it pushed us in the Welsh government to think about what clarity, stability and sustainability for Welsh devolution would look like. And then, of course, we published the Alternative Wales Bill, published that in March of last year. Now, our Alternative bill got overtaken by events, the Assembly elections, then, of course, the Brexit referendum. But it still has relevance, and it provides an answer as to how a stable Welsh devolution settlement can operate in a more federal UK. I was proud to see it incorporated as well as official UK Labour policy through this year's election manifesto. So, I want to finish by tackling what I see as a major piece of this unfinished devolution jigsaw. We tried, without success, to pursue matters relating to justice, covering youth justice, the courts, probation and prisons, matters that were addressed by Silk, but, but overlooked by the UK government in the context of our amendments to the Wales Bill last year. This is the only jurisdiction in the world, as far as I'm aware, where there are two parliaments making laws in the same jurisdiction. Now, as a former lawyer, that makes no sense. People out there don't care, I know that. But what it means is, that it makes it very difficult for people to understand the difference. I have been told by senior judges they have barristers appearing in front of them and arguing the wrong law, because they assume that the law applies equally and consistently across England and Wales. That has got to change. We put forward what we thought was an elegant solution. We have a distinct formal jurisdiction. We share the same courts. 
Why set up a different court system for no reason at all? But you create that separation that's needed in order for people to understand that, Wales, that Welsh law exists now in a way that it never existed before. You don't put barriers up, so it'll be a common law jurisdiction. Still able to practice in Wales if you're from England or Northern Ireland or from any other common law jurisdiction. But it's difficult to operate in a system where you've got two legislatures in one jurisdiction. It's unheard of anywhere in the world. I've been clear that these were matters that I felt we needed to return to, and it's become increasingly clear to me, as I set out today, that this nettle has to be grasped. There are a whole set of overlapping issues in relation to both the jurisdiction and delivery of justice, where I believe the current arrangements can and must be improved. Let me give you an example. UK government introduces policies to deal with prisoner rehabilitation once they've left prison. No one will disagree with that. It says we want to provide services in health, education, apprenticeships. They're all devolved. Who pays? That's the, one, of the, one of the issues that we have to wrestle with. All these things could be resolved if everything sat in the same box, and they don't at the moment. So, today, I'm delighted to announce that Lord Thomas of Cumgeath has agreed to chair a commission on justice in Wales when he steps down next month from his responsibilities as Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. And I'll provide further details of the Commission's membership and terms of reference later on this year with a view to it beginning its work in early next year. Now that work will play an important part in exploring the next steps for devolution in Wales as we enter the next chapter. So, 20 years on we are a nation transformed, not just in terms of our new democracy, but more in terms of our newfound confidence. I see every day a generation of young people who are fearless, who are educated and grounded in Wales and firmly believe the future belongs to them and that the world is out there to conquer. I meet them all the time. But they want to stay in Wales. They don't see that they have to go elsewhere. I remember the Yes for Wales conference in Llandrindod back in 1997. Kevin Morgan was there and Kevin used the phrase, we've got to get away from the idea that if you want to get on, get out. Your phrase, I remember you saying it, Kevin. And that's changing. People now see a confident nation where they can make a living and make a difference for the better. But none of this can be taken for granted. The acid test for devolution was always and always will be in the ways which, in which we can improve the lives of people and communities up and down the country. And that remains my ambition and the ambition of the Welsh Government. So, tomorrow, the Assembly's official plenary sessions restart. For 45 minutes, I'll take questions on everything from creative industries to local bus routes, uh, it's a matter of some wonder and annoyance to my staff that I have a slightly encyclopedic and anarchy knowledge of train times and bus routes around <laughs> Wales. But we'll also present our papers on Brexit and immigration. We'll be setting up our long-term ambitions for our nation as we launch a new strategy for government. We'll debate the long-term future of the NHS in Wales. We'll debate, we'll argue. We won't agree on everything. Of course not, that's democracy. But at the end of the day, we'll decide. We'll make our own decisions about the future of Wales. And that's what devolution has given us. A voice, confidence, control of our own destiny. And the next 20 years are shaping up to be more eventful than the last. But I'm confident that together we can rise to each challenge and continue to build the fair, open and prosperous nation that we all want Wales to become. In 1997, if you had said to me the day after that result that we would, 20 years on, be on the threshold of a lawmaking, tax varying parliament, I would not have believed you. That's how far we've come. Hugely important that that institution delivers. It's not enough to have it, but to use it in the best possible way. But the important thing is the debate about that now takes place in Wales, and in 1997, it didn't. So that gives you some idea of where I was. I can't believe it was 20 years ago now. Uh, 20 years ago, how things have developed over the past 20 years and in the future, who knows? But the important thing is, we'll decide. Thanks.